Kapoa, No My Hari Mai Kikine Hui, or Robert Scott Tukalino. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is day three of Hearing Four. Um, our first stop submitter is Waikani Limited. Um, welcome. Um, we're in your hands as to how you want to present uh, your submission, but I just want to give us a quick over, overview of how you want to present your case. Certainly, sir. Thank you. Oh, we've got a note. Oh, sorry. We need to do a karaoke. Ah, yes. Ah, hoki do mo ki arana rangi e tune. Hoki raro ki a papa e papa tune. Hoki roko ki te ngako tangata. Hoki waho ki te ne hui. Hoki e hui e tarangi. And that is find above, find to rangi, find above, find to papa, find inside, find the heart. Bring it forth to this gathering, bind together, make it strong. Well, thank you, Lisa Kate. Um, so, yes, back to you. Um, how would you like to present these submissions to us? Tina Kwisu, Tina Kato, Kwakatoa. So, yes, so, so, I'm, so I'm Dave Randall, um, and with my colleague, Ben Kalpa. Um, it's our great pleasure to be legal counsel for Waitangi Limited, um, speaking in support of its submission to you today in this beautiful place. Um, thank you very much for having us all. Um, so yeah, uh, we filed some uh, some written legal submissions, some sort of brief ones yesterday, which the panel may or may not have had a chance to cast an eye over. Assuming not so much, given your busy schedule, um, I was proposing just to take you through them pretty briefly. It wouldn't, wouldn't take me too long. Yes. Uh, and then we have three witnesses for Waitangi Limited here: um, Mr. Dalton, Ms. Jacobs, and Mr. Cocker at the end. Uh, and you know. Um, they are prepared to so we file summaries and sort of short presentations for them as well. And we just propose to take you through those in turn afterwards if it's okay. So just to confirm, we we've read all the pre-circulated yes. evidence. Um we had a very full day yesterday and the day before for that matter. Um so we haven't had a chance to um fully review your legal subs, but thank you for um giving to us very good. So we'll be in your hands as to how you want to um, deliver that. Thank you, sir. Yes, I'll take you through them briefly, um, leaving good space, I hope, for the witnesses. It's certainly not looking to steal it. Yeah, but if, if you all have that document in front of your legal submissions, well, um, we've got other just copies. Just to confirm that we, what we've done is we've allocated, I think, through to the 10 30 morning's tea break. <coughs> we've got a one and a half hour run, so. Um, I'm okay, so use up all that time. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll probably get a short of my 45 two minute application, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, certainly happy to answer any questions along the way, of course, as well. Um, so, yeah, by reference to that, the, the legal submissions document, um, um, there are, you know, it starts off with an introduction, and there are paragraphs 1.1 to 1.3, which I'll just speak to. Um, you know, they, they introduce, of course, a place. Um, with which we're all very familiar, um, the Waitangi Estate. Uh, and the, the, the paragraphs introduce some administration and ownership um, uh, details that probably perhaps are less familiar. Um, and it's a very interesting story um, it, with some historical parallels, I might suggest, uh, between 100 years ago and the Kopapa of today, 100 years on, more or less, which is to say that. It was in the early 1930s that the arrangements were put in place um, for the administration of the Waitangi estate um, by, by Lord and Lady Glenslow, who, who bought the, the land. I might suggest, with a, with a view to the upcoming centenary celebrations um, in, in 1940, the century of the signing of Te Tiriti, of course, um, which became, as, we pro as you probably know, um, a very significant historical event uh, and celebration for this country. Here we are, oh, and, and sorry, in, in those arrangements and, and you know, purchasing the land, um, basically vesting it in um, preeminent local people and people from around New Zealand and entrusting in them the administration of this very special place for the benefit of us all. Um, special legislation was created which enshrined a trustee, um, which really, it, it kind of it made it its own thing. You know, um, and empowered these these trustees to look after this land in an efficient way for so so we can all enjoy it. Um, uh, as I say, with an eye to these centenary celebrations. Here we are, a hundred years on, um, 
Of course, uh, in 2035, we've got the bicentenary of the signing of Hipakaputanga. Five years on from that, of course, the bicentenary of uh, Te Tiriti. And again, you know, th these, these events are looming very large um, on, the, on the, the horizon of Waitangi. Um, and it's in that context that we come before you, um, you know, acknowledging that you're doing your own thing, setting a district plan for, for, for the whole um, of the far north. And I guess asking you to perpetuate the arrangements that were put in place back then, which is to, in, a, in an RMA planning frame, to set up a framework um, that allows the trustees and Waitangi Limited um, scope to administer, to do its thing in an efficient way for all of our benefit. Um, just, I'll pick up a bit, paragraph 1.4, where I talk about the special significance of Waitangi, and that, that will be obviously well understood to us all. Um, I certainly won't labour the point, but it is. That, that specialness is the foundation of, of our case, really. It's, it's that specialness, the uniqueness, uh, and the importance to all New Zealanders is the reason why Waitangi comes to you asking for a special um, framework to be put in place to allow its efficient management. And, and it's worth reflecting, I think, it's not just, it's, it's obviously so significant in terms of our nationhood uh, and our Māori relationship, um, but, but a, a place of nationhood for, for, for all New Zealanders and indeed for visitors to New Zealand, it's, uh, um, it's so significant in that respect. Um, but in terms of your kaupapa, it's also worth reflecting on the importance of Waitangi for the district, because it's you know it is the major draw card for people to come to Far North, um, and it's a major employer in the district as well. So it's uh, significant on any number of levels. And um, picking up at one point five, so Waitangi Limited has made this submission, um, and and the relief it seeks relates solely to the estate, to, to the Waitangi estate. Um, it's not seeking to alter outcomes, influence plans. The secondary relief, you know, would change provisions relating to the overlays, including specific and natural landscapes and things. So there might be, you know, what I think limited isn't doesn't isn't particularly concerned about how those rules operate elsewhere around the district, but if some of its fallback relief is accepted and recommended by the panel, there, there might be some consequences, which could be dealt with by again treating my tongue in a special way. But, um, um, the, 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 the basis of Waitangi Limited submission, and you will agree, as you say, so you've pre read the evidence, um, and, and it's a point very clearly, I think, made by the witnesses that the proposed plan as it stands is unworkable for Waitangi, uh, for Waitangi Limited. And there are kind of two main reasons for that. One is that it's uh, described it as a planning hotspot, and it's you know, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a confluence of values and interests and activities all in one place um, that has led, you know, naturally and understandably to sort of layer upon layer upon layer of, um, of planning regulation, basically, uh, which makes for a very, very complex situation. And to illustrate that, you know, there are three, there are three zone, land zonings within the estate, um, including, I mean, the main one, you might say is rural production. So, so the the, the treaty grounds themselves uh, zone rural production. And I'm sure I don't need to make a point out. It's kind of an anathema to what actually goes on there. And there are a couple of others. Uh, there's a, a mixed use zone. I think with a hotel is a recreation zone. So there's the, there's the three zones. And then there are the overlays. So specific to this hearing, uh, the coastal environment and the coastal environment, of course. Um, there's an outstanding natural landscape over the treaty grounds. Um, and there are a couple of ONFs in play. It's obviously a side of significance to Māori as well as others, and, and so on. And because, um, in the usual way, the proposed plan, the, the interaction of these overlays, um, of course, set rules and things, 
the most stringent applies to any particular activity. Um, even aside from the city having to work all that out, and um, once you go through that exercise, you'll find, and Ms. Jacobs Evidence has this long and I'd suggest very powerful list of activities, common everyday activities, that on any analysis, none of us would expect Waitangi Limited to have to go off and get a resource consent to undertake because they're so um, obviously necessary in order for people to have a, a positive visitor experience, for example, in a special place. Um, yeah, there are these unintended consequences in terms of red tape and um, yeah, administrative RMA burden for Waitangi Limited that, that comes out of the, the provisions as proposed. Um, so hence, hence the submission from Waitangi Limited and, and commissioners will tell you more, much more about this in a year's time actually, but there is a very elegant solution to that problem. Um, the National Planning Standards envisage this sort of situation a very special place with this complexity and things that don't quite work. Um, uh, and that, that solution is special purpose zoning. And, and um, we'll tell you all about that uh, in due course. Um, because, of course, um, today today's not the day for that. So, so commissioners, you will have, uh, you'll be aware of this, I'm sure. But, um, of course, this hearing four is focusing on Personal environment landscape matters. I just want to say, I mean, if, if your if your case is an either or case, it's like yes. we have the special purpose zone, and if not, we would like um, special recognition um, within the zoning and or overlay provisions. Then um, it might be it might be helpful to us to at least indicate your what case you're going to be bringing to us when it comes to rezoning, because that's a long way down the path. Yes. Um, you know, and so it'd be good to have an idea and a way to hear as to what you're actually seeking. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we, we were thinking the same. We thought that might be useful for you, but we didn't want to labour that point either because yes. we're conscious you're dealing with the here and now of the coastal environment matters and let's get that. So I just want to give you the confidence to talk about it, even though it's not the topic that's here. Great. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I suppose in terms of this introduction, I'll talk about paragraph um, 1.7. There, yeah, hearing 19. Uh, we will be coming back. You know, Ms. Jacobs has been developing developing up some special zone provisions um, tailored bespoke, you know, for White Tangy Limited. Uh, there's a process to go through to finalise those provisions and analysis and draft, and then to talk about those, you know, of course with the council team, um, of course with with um, the uh, and of course with um, with further submitters on White Tangy Limited submission uh, as well, which notably. I, I guess most notably it includes here in New Zealand or Hedda Tonga. Um, <coughs> yeah, and then, and then come back to you next year with a fulsome report on that, you know, provisions, um, section 32 analysis, you know, analysing the you know, cost and benefits and all those sorts of things, the efficiency and effectiveness of, of what's being put before you, a report on the process of consultation that's been undertaken, um, and yeah, and, and, and we'll present that to you next year. Um, and and I, will get, I will get into that a bit more soon just to explain precisely what that might look like. <coughs> and then at 1.8 now, there's a secondary relief point which is specific to, to this hearing. Um, and Ms. Jacobs and Mr. Cochran in particular will, will take you through the details of those. They, but I, I'd, I'd signal they are, they are sort of technical matters. I hesitate to say they're minor because, you know, they're, they're about issues like, for example, permitted building footprint um, <coughs> natural landscape for example it's not, a, it's not a triviality but you know um and as i want to signal for you um you know they are down down the sort of more technical end of the spectrum so at 1.9 yeah that gives you an overview of why we're here and what we're going to be presenting to you about today and in a year's time in that special zone hearing um next there are there are four legal matters that I want to, to address the panel on very briefly uh, on the way through and then we'll introduce the witnesses. Um, section two of the submissions, uh, I'll skip over, sir, if that's all right with you. I'm very happy to answer any questions about it. Basically, we'll just set out there for completeness an overview of the framework 
that you will have to apply to your recommendations and the council will apply to its decision making in due course. Um, with all you know, you'll, that stuff you will be well familiar with and have had a number of times already in this process, I'm familiar. Um, what, we will, what I will signal though is that next year when we come back in in respect of the special zoning proposal, um, we will walk you through just exactly why and how that aligns very strongly with, with the framework that you're operating with. You know, so for example, there'll be, a, like I say, a full some section 32 analysis, which tells you all about why what Waitangi Limited is proposing, you know, furthers the purpose and principles of the Act, the higher higher order directives, including the coastal policy statement, you know, as relevant to what you're thinking about this week, um, the costs and the benefits, the efficiency and effectiveness and all that. So we'll we'll tie it all back to that framework for you. <coughs> if I could step forward to section three, just on page five of the document, uh, there's the good old scope issue. Um, there are two angles to uh, two, two, two issues, I guess, relevant to scope that you'll be thinking about in, in respect of all submissions. Uh, and I just want to address you briefly on, on those two. The first, first of those issues, and I'm conscious again, we've had submissions from other legal counsel, from other submitters and indeed from the council about this sort of stuff, so you won't be hearing anything new. There's the age old issue of whether a submission is on the plan change. You know, um, there are cases like um, clear water, motor machinists, with which you'll be very familiar. You know, where, where there's this principle that a submitter has to seek relief that's basically on a spectrum between the status quo and what the proposed plan um, is putting forward as a continuum of arranging. Um, but you'll also know that in a full plan review, and this is just a spotter's decision in the Albany, Albany case. On a full plan review like the far north is undergoing now, um, those principles don't really hold so much. Uh, and there's very broad scope for a submitted to seek relief um, that isn't within that, that band. And then, of course, is because in a full review process, um, things are up for grabs and people throughout the district um, should be aware and are aware that if they're interested in the way the planning regime is going to roll out across the district, they should be um, you know, monitoring the situation closely, making further submissions uh, as necessary, which a number of people, of course, have. Um, yeah, so that's that. That's, that's that. Um, but, but in terms of Waitangi Limited submission, um, the, we, again, we'll come back to this next year when we tell you the detail of the special purpose zoning proposal. But the obvious thing to make is there's clearly scope on any analysis because Waitangi Limited won't be, won't be proposing any fundamental change to the use of that land. You know, so there's an old operative regime, planning regime for the land. Um, there's the new regime set out a proposed plan. Um, and things might change and then some special zoning that special purpose zoning that one thing you limited is seeking. But in terms of the use of that land, it's kind of immutable. You know, the trust holds it on trust, set up back in the 1930s um, for these very important purposes um, of allowing people to enjoy the place, um, appreciate its historical significance and some associated recreation and other values. You know, nothing's going to change. So um, we're talking about matters of planning efficiency rather than um, any fundamental change of land use, if that, if that makes sense. So, in so scope terms, you know, it's just a, it's just, a, it's, it's technical, technical matters that we we'll focus on. That makes sense. The second, the, the second scope issue um, to touch on, of course, is that that, that issue that you know a submitter having asked for some relief, the panel's doing its job considering that and then making recommendations back to the council, of course. The recommendations and then what the council actually decides has to be has to re fairly and reasonably reflect what the submitters asked for. So that's just an, a, a, the second scope issue um, to, for you to keep an eye on, and that will explain to you next year um, that what we're asking you to do is fairly and reasonably range from what we're coming the submission. But I, but I can signal right now that in terms of special purpose zoning, that's exactly what the submission does. That, you know, explains, as I'm trying to explain to you, but clumsily, why it's needed and requests it. 
So those are the, the, the two strike points. Um, section four of this document um, <clears throat> attempts to summarize why a special purpose zone is appropriate. Ms. Jacob's evidence goes into detail of that, on that point, and you read that and understood it well, I'm sure. Um, by way of a very, very brief summary, you know, the national planning standards, centralized central government document, you know, which I'm tell you what it is, um, sets out some criteria where special zoning, special purpose zoning will be appropriate. And um, respectfully, you know, I don't make this submission lightly, it's difficult actually to conceive of a circumstance that is more, that, that more obviously leads you to special purpose zoning than the circumstances of the Waitangi estate. Um, the three criteria are significant, you know, the importance of this particular place for the district, you know. Um, talk about that and it's kind of obvious. It is um, it's hard to think of a more, a place that's more significant to more people than, uh, than the white community state. The other two criteria are about impractical, Im, Im, the impracticality of um, of administering that place um, using a different, using another zone. You know, again, here we've got this mix um, of things which do not neatly fit within one zone, or indeed a number of zones. Um, the evidence suggests that if you're going to pick one zone, recreation might be the closest to it, closer, closer probably than rural production. But you know, it just I think it's quite clear to see that. The, 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 the typical zones just don't fit this land and the, the, the multiple purposes um, and activities that people have. Uh, and the third criterion is also about impracticality, impracticality of managing different things through different spatial layers. And here we see that again for the reasons I've touched on. Uh, they all converge and overlap, as Ms. Jacobs is going to show us. Um, and it does lead to a very impractical um, outcome, which, which simply just doesn't that doesn't really work. <coughs> um, so picking up at, at 4.5, that impracticality is evidence, as I said before, by this this long list. Here are four examples of A to D. But there's a much longer list in Ms. Jacobs evidence at paragraph 8.15 um, listing activities which as I say on any analysis none of us I think would expect Waitangi, Waitangi Limited to have to go off and get rid of these, um, these very minor but works, footpath upgrades to improve disability access to buildings, um, planting trees, uh, expanding even, even very small scale expansions of existing car parks, installing bench setting. Um, I would note that, you know, in terms of this hearing for um, the coastal provisions, the provisions around outstanding natural landscapes and things, those provisions are not necessarily the ones that are triggering these consent requirements. Um, hence this sort of difficulty of trying to fix this problem incrementally. Actually, a lot of the rub for a lot of these, I think, comes from the provisions relating to um, sites of significance to Māori. Some of them do. Uh, and so that's a matter for another day and another hearing. But I kind of make the point now that, um, that, that there's an illustration in there, I think, that, that the Waitangi estate is quite different from a lot of other sites of significance to Māori. I think we can probably understand that intuitively. Um, where, for example, digging holes, erecting structures like beaches, um, may well be inappropriate. Um, but in Waitangi Limited, those things are absolutely essential uh, for this place to be appreciated by the people, which is, you know, it's, very, it's, it's now it's the very reason for it being and held by the trust for those purposes. I'm getting, getting into the detail probably for another day, but I yeah, hope, hope you understand the point is this yeah, confluence of interests. They all layer up in, in a way that's um, very, very hard to untangle for expert planners, let alone for lay plan users <laughs> and readers of the plan.
So we talked about the solution of um, special purpose zoning. And to your point, sir, um, if, I, if I turn over the page to 4.7, um, in terms of what, what conceptually special purpose zoning might, might in, entail, um, these are the things the panel should expect to see when you get the detail of this, um, you know, the lead up to that hearing 19. Um, a special purpose zoning would provide an efficient and effective management approach to the estate by including tailored objectives, policies, and rules that reflect the special nature of the estate and its varied values, sensitivities, and land uses. Um, clear objectives and policies that protect historic heritage and the value of the estate, um, including those currently provided for by the overlays in the post plan, and provide for operational activities to be undertaken by Waitangi Limited. Um, and rules that provide appropriate protections for different parts of the estate and also enable operational activities to be undertaken without, um, without requiring consent for those activities. <clears throat> um, so you may you may well be, uh, so just to unpack, unpack one aspect of that is that, you know, obviously in this hearing you're, you're considering matters, for example, outside of natural landscapes. And in terms of the ONL at at the Waitangi estate, um, you know, I just want to say to you very clearly that there's no dispute as to the, the values that underlie, uh, underpin that ONL. No, no material dispute as to any of that, or indeed the boundaries of the ONL as map, anything like that. Um, so there's no, uh, so, so just to, to get that clear in your minds, the special purpose zoning that we'll come back to will respect that and um, work with that. And indeed, you, you might have read, read from the evidence that in some cases, for example, um, building footprint within that ONL, Waitangi Limited experts actually think there should be a more restrictive standard there at Waitangi than for other, there might be merited for other ONLs throughout the district. Um, yeah, all, all of which is just to say that, that um, the special purpose zoning you know, it's not, uh, you'll, you'll understand, uh, it's not about a developer of land coming to you and asking for a sort of a blank box development to try and cut away red tape and maximize profits. That's exactly what this is not about. This is about Waitangi Limited We're trying to just put a split, um, framework in place that respects all of those values and its different sensitivities in different parts of the land, but enables things in an efficient way where appropriate. If I turn just very quickly to section uh, to part five of this document, um, this is sort of the fourth, the fourth legal point that I just wanted to flag for you, and we'll come back to next year. This is the fact of this um, empowering legislation, the, the, the Trust Board Act. Um, again, uh, often people will come to you asking for relaxation of 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 the plan provisions to enable some commercial purpose and fair play. That's absolutely fine. It's, normal part of the process, but that's just not the situation here. Um, the, the way the trust holds the land for the benefit of all New Zealanders um, is immutable, really. It's going to continue into the future. And um, as I say, this is, um, yeah, this is more about planning efficiency. But, but that Trust Board Act is important, um, including because it under, underlies, underscores rather the uniqueness of this site. I'm not sure that's the place that you'll be considering through submissions that has its own legislation with that public benefit purpose baked in. Um, yeah, and, and we're simply looking for a planning framework that kind of aligns with that well. We'll come back to that next year as the same. Um, section six is about the matters specific to this area, and I, I actually have a signal at the start, so I don't really have any legal particular legal issues to signal for you, but very happy to, um, to deal with any as they want to through the morning, answer any questions you might have about those things. Um, Ms. Jacobs, so her summary, which we'll get to um, relatively soon, she's got a table at the end of that, which, which the panel might, might well be assisted by Ms. Jacobs taking them through that. That really does break down. Uh, in terms of the secondary relief, specific to this hearing, um, all of the, the, the points raised in Waitangi Limited submission, the points where, as between the reporting officers now and Ms. Jacobs, there's alignment and highlights 
the residual, the few residual areas of some disagreement, and as I say, yeah, yeah. Um, so that is the table we'll get to in due course. Um, as I say, Commissioner, it's very happy to answer any questions, but that's that's really all I wanted to address you on um, before introducing the three witnesses, starting with Mr. Dalton, who's the Chief Executive um, of Waitangi Limited, uh, followed by Ms. Jacobs, uh, followed by Mr. Cockett. Um, but so, yeah, that's, that, that's me for now. No, no, thank you very much. Um, um, I, I think your legal submissions are quite clear, so I, I don't have any questions for you, but there may be some from other family. Mm -hmm. So that's a unanimous, thank you, a clear and concise submissions. Um, so we'll move on to your first question. Thank you. Yeah. So Mr. Dolphin will let him introduce himself and then a, a presentation that he's going to work through. Uh, <coughs> Kohao <laughs> Um, it's at that we're meeting here, and presumably somebody's told you where you are. <laughs> and um, you know, this is the returning place of Kukwe, and there are two uh, Tanifa, Arai Teuru, and Niwa up there, and this is the one of the most sacred parts of Napoli. And when you drive back out towards uh, Kaikohe and then back to Auckland, or the airport on the left hand side, you'll see Fedia Mountain, which is about in his park. So I hope someone came and told you, maybe John Clarisich or uh, even Shane Lloyd and Co. as to where you are. So Waitangi fits in within um, that spectrum of the sacred sites of Napoli. Um, my name is Ben Dolphin. I have been back here since September. Um, I've been away for 24 years in Wellington. My role is there included Chief Executive of Crown Forestry Rental Trust, Deputy Chief Executive of Fisheries, Deputy Director General of MPI, Chief Operating Officer of the Provincial Growth Fund, and finally Deputy Chief Executive of Housing. Um, there was a concerted effort to get me to come and run Waitangi as the Chief Executive, and it took me a couple of weeks after taking the role to realise why they wanted me to come. Um, the, the Waitangi National Trust does not run at a profit. Um, in fact, it runs at a significant loss. It does not get baseline funding from the Crown, even though, as um, David said before, we hold the estate on behalf of all New Zealanders. So presumably at some stage in the future, the government may wish to provide baseline funding. Um, when Lord and Lady Bledisloe made the um, magnanimous gift of the land to the nation, they also included an extra 500 hectares um, of land to presumably to be able to provide an income to support um, the the estate and then, and then the separate 500 hectares of uh, forest that is now attached to um, the Waitangi National or the Waitangi Forest. Sorry, um, unfortunately, time has passed and the money we make of the either the forest or the extra 500 hectares. Um, goes nowhere near where it should do to sustain um, the estate. We get around five hundred dollars a hectare for the um, pastoral leases. We get a hundred between one hundred and fifty and one hundred and sixty thousand a year off the five hundred hectares of um, pine forest, and our leases with the golf club and the boat club are a little over a hundred thousand a year. And the probably the best that we get is off the Cogthorn. 
which is around half a million a year. So you can see that that it, in the previous time it would have worked, and it does not work now. Um, the types of things that you have to put up with is well not put up as part of our duty, but um, this recent Waitangi went for seven days, and um, when I was a kid, you watched the uh, the um, the uh, Woodstock movie, and that guy ran around on his motorcycle. Well, it's seven days of Woodstock. <laughs> and, um, and the other thing is, you don't know who's coming. So you've got, um, you know, people are ringing like during during December and January. If like everyone forgets about Waitangi, the government forgets about it right up until December. I know this because I was a senior official, and around about late December, they start going, "What are we going to say at Waitangi?" And then you have this man rush right around to try to put this together, a list of all the things for Māori, so that when the PM gets up to speak, he can talk about all the great things. But unfortunately, in this current political climate, there's not a lot of good things for the government. So hence why the crowd was so big this year, 60,000 people came. But it's that's on one day. That's not what's been going on across seven days. So you have to provide security, food, traffic management, uh, you name it, we have to think about it. And, um, and there are some pretty significant moments where you're teetering on, you know, um, like the bridge on the, uh, on, the, on the fifth and the sixth is extremely dangerous. When, when I think about um, the, the Hajj, we only had 20,000 people in that rush and a whole lot of people got killed. When I tried to cross the bridge at one point during that, it was like, man, anything can happen right at this very moment. And, um, uh, and then also the political issues around trying to maintain peace when, when the um, Prime Minister, I don't know if you guys will saw that on TV, but when the Prime Minister and Kerr were speaking, there, there was a, a certain moment during that where you're like, we're going to lose this, and had we have lost it, then um, race relations in the country would have been a lot more damaged than they are right now. This coming year, it will be exactly the same, and it may even be bigger because the changes in the NACA, or you guys are all planners, so you know it's coming, um, that will just wind it up even further. And also the, the, um, the bill, the treaty provisions and all that kind of thing. So 60,000 this year, it'll be 80, 80 in the coming year. And um, we're currently in the process of trying to work out with these guys over here a proper traffic management plan and uh, all the rest of it. We can't stop people from coming. Um, we thought we had a deal with the heat boy last this year, um, and then all the young warriors who want to make a name for themselves, they decide they don't want to be a part of an official decoy and turn up and start occupying the, um, you know, the um, line. Anyway, that's my reality. Um, in terms of trying to, um, where we're going to, I should use this because Ralph's spent a lot of time <laughs> but most of this you've already heard from these guys, so I don't want to repeat what they're saying. Um, this that is pretty I do like this picture. Like the one at the bottom left hand side is the modern battalion um, marching up there in full winter gear on February the whatever, February the sixth. They must have been killing them, but probably all they had at that time. And within a year, those guys are all in Greece and Crete, and a lot of them are probably dead as well. So, and then that's this year with the um, church service in the morning. Um, most people felt that despite the fact that it could have gone belly up uh, this year, it didn't. And a good time was had by all, but you can't always guarantee that. Why that's important is because the cost of putting that on you can imagine is way beyond what we get paid. So we're, we're in the process of trying to figure out what does it cost us to run Waitangi. Then we're expected to do ANZAC and, um, you know, and 
maybe half a dozen major um, events throughout the year. And obviously within the next 16 years, we're gonna have Y2040 and um, try to get the government to think about putting some investment in now. Hopefully we've got a um, regional infrastructure fund application in, and I think it's funded, that'll be enough to um, uh, that house there, the meeting house, the floors had it. So we're gonna have to put a new floor in. The, um, the actual Waitangi um, uh, house itself, the treaty house, uh, the roof needs to be replaced. And obviously you can't just go and put um, you know, <laughs> corrugated iron on it, you've got to do it properly. So, and then with the addition of the, of the uh, two museums, each one of those, you've got to insure them, you'll do the lighting, our power bills are over 20,000 a month. So, um, I guess where I'm going to with this is that whatever uh, planning regime we end up with can't be so restrictive that it narrows our options down about what we can do about making money further than it is right now. So, um, there, there's been uh, talk about maybe a hotel, another hotel up the top. Um, my preference would be to sort out the one we've got already. But um, at some stage, Waitangi is either going to have to get baseline funding from the Crown or find a way of better utilising the land that it has inherited from, uh, from the Bledisloes. And that may um, require having to build different things. Um, there's beautiful sites um, all around the place. You can look at that and think, because um, we're entitled to sell up to one sixth of the estate as well under the trustee. And um, I mean, if you can't get baseline and if we continue, we've probably got enough retained earnings for what is not another cyclone or a pandemic. Uh, we've probably got about two years, um, maybe 18 months funding left. So if we get this roof application, that will help us. Um, we will be able to utilize the money we've got budgeted for maintenance and repairs that will keep us going. But even that alone will probably give us maybe three, four, five years maximum. So somewhere along the line, there's going to have to be some investment in ways of making more money. So if, um, when people celebrate it, getting the uh, Te Raumaroa, which is the Māori Battalion Museum, and the other one, the earlier one, from the time of uh, Stephen Joyce, those are great things, and people who come there love them. But they all cost money to run. And we're currently in a process like the rest of New Zealand of retrenching our expenses um, we're doing the sinking lid like everybody else. Um, I have reduced my time at uh, Waitangi to 50% as a way of, um, we set ourselves a target of saving a saving million dollars out of the deficit for this year and probably for next year as well. Um, and if we do get the rough money, well, that will alleviate to a certain degree, we've also got foundation more than everybody else, but those are only stopgap measures. So somewhere along the line, this thing is going to have to be able to wash its face. <coughs> the tourism um, issues, you're all familiar with that, is really fantastic. Um, Lonely Planet ranked tourism feature down the road here in Marnia, but they're in the same boat. Um, and the problems that Northern Lloyd says is you need a road, and the, the uh, Manamoki keeps washing out, and um, so the Green Dillons keeps washing out. And hopefully, uh, we can get the road up to at least Fine at Eight for Lane Highway. But then I saw yesterday Northport went and um, wants to appeal there. So you'll muck around for the next 10 years with people appealing. And um, I'll be long gone by the time the road comes, but there you go. So, anyway, you know all this about the sites of national significance and all that kind of thing. This is a famous photo of uh, Apina Minata leading the um, Maori Battalion Haka um, on February the 6th, 1840. 
Ralph just explained to me the only reason he's doing that is because the actual uh, Ngāpuri minister was crook, so being a good Ngāti pro, he took advantage of the situation. <laughs> he will enshrine himself in history. <laughs> and a good friend of mine, Te Rau Kūpina, um, he wants to allow him to the Haka in, in uh, 2040. Anyway, there you go, that's about it. We've got also 80, um, 2035 will be the uh, 200th anniversary of the Um That's like a religion up here. And the Waitangi Tribunal obviously um, found that Ngāpuhi did not seek sovereignty um, at the signing. Um, the finding also says that over time the Crown did assume sovereignty, but at the moment, nobody in Ngāpuhi worries about the second part, and they worry about the first part. So that will be the basis of our, um, the treaty settlements kind of have that in there somewhere. And, all, and Waitangi is so central to um, Hei Whakaputanga, Te Tiriti, the Treaty of Waitangi, however you want to look at it going forward. Yeah. And uh, all New Zealand is a part, if, if your people have been here since, in, uh, from the early days, um, there is a high chance that they had something to do with Waitangi. And I can talk about my partner. Um, when we first met in a border up here, she's back here, and uh, she said, oh, I've got no connection to the north. Um, and, but her father's sister married a Māori and had two kids. And during COVID, one of them had done all their whakapapa and it turned out that her director, my uncle Robert, uh, Richard Taylor, um, was the person who hand wrote Te Tiriti. So everybody has a connection to my tongue in the truth. Anyway, that's my evidence. Kia ora. Well, thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, thank you, Ralph, for your work. <laughs> yeah, a very, very good presentation, but wasn't presented well. Um, yeah, we just want to acknowledge the significant role that you have in, in what you do for all New Zealanders. Um, Waitangi is a very special place. I've been there multiple times. I went to two Waitangi days, enjoyed both of them. I was there the year that the um, Maori Italian New Zealand was dedicated. That was, that was really special. It's a very, very, um, very good New Zealand. Um, so I think we all recognise uh, the job you do, and thank you for giving us the context of how you run it and the difficulties you face. Um, you have the word limited, uh, which sort of presumes that you're, you know, you're dealing with lots of money, but you, you've been again quite clearly to us that you operate at a significant loss and, and you rely on the goodwill of central government and others to, to keep this very important uh, tower operating. So, Thank you very much for that. I'll see if any of the other uh, panel members have any questions for you. And then very convincing um, and well delivered. So thanks for coming up. Move on to your next one. Thank you, sir. Yes, Mr. Jacobs. Um, we've again sent around a uh, summary of uh, evidence, which hopefully you've been yes. there. Thank you, Rochelle, to walk you through it. Thank you. Morning, all. For Rochelle Jacobs, Tapua Moa. Um, as detailed in the law, the Waitangi estate comprises a number of sites which have high significance in terms of New Zealand's history. As the location where the Tiriti of the Waitangi was first signed between Māori and the British Crown on the 6th of February 1840. From a planning perspective, the proposed district plan seeks to establish 11 different zones and overlays across the estate. Um, as described before, there are three different zones uh, that are being proposed. Um, the first is the mixed use zone, which is the pink uh, zone there, which is covering uh, the football. Um, notably, there's also another smaller site there uh, next to the football, uh, which is the start housing for the football. Um, that has been zone reduction. Um, next is the sport and active recreation zone. That's the um, the brighter green colour. That covers the uh, golf course, but only actually half of the golf course. 
The other half of the golf course has been zoned rural production, as well as the treaty grounds and the remainder of the state. Um, it's quite interesting just going back and having a bit of a look at the previous zone history, suite of district plans uh, that have come out. And there's been a bit of a mixture from, from people over the years trying to decide what to do with Black Honey. Um, there's been uh, like a conservation type zoning that was put across Waitangi at some point. Uh, there's been commercial zoning. It's every district plan, it seems to vary, uh, but no one's really got it right. Um, in terms of the, the conservation zoning, it looks like they tried to put that across the upper treaty grounds in the operative plan, but actually they've put it in the wrong location and it covers uh, the bottom um, part of the treaty ground. So doing resource consensus at the moment, um, you end up having a bit of a split zoning anyway between general coastal um, and the conservation zone. And so nothing even now really matches. Um, the coastal environment covers almost all of the estate. Um, there are four little areas uh, which it doesn't. Uh, the one down the bottom uh, is leased to the pony club. Uh, the next one up is uh, Mount Lidenway. Um, and then you've got a area and then uh, half of some staff housing site. Uh, there's two outstanding natural features. Uh, the first one is Harubu Falls, uh, which just encroaches on the uh, western portion of the estate. And then uh, the second one is a rocky outcrop, which starts just north of the flagpole on the treaty grounds. Uh, next is outstanding natural landscape. Now, this doesn't actually cover all of the treaty ground. It covers most of it, but there is a little area of land that they, uh, when they released it in the regional policy statement, they didn't include, um, which is just down the bottom. And notably, this this is a new outstanding natural landscape. This isn't actually um, mapped in the operative district plan. Uh, there's quite a few areas of financial character. Generally, this covers areas of bush that are across the estate. And notably, a lot of this bush was actually planted between around the 1950s and 1980s. Um, if you look back at old aerials, most of the, this area uh, was all farmland. There is a sort of area, a uh, site of Fox and Pertz to Māori. Uh, this has been taken from the Heritage New Zealand list. Um, it covers Te Pito Whenua, which is the treaty grounds. Um, what's in the uh, schedule reflects what's in the Heritage New Zealand list, but what's on the map uh, appears to be a bit of a mapping error because it only covers a very small portion of the treaty grounds, which is actually just below the uh, New Mali Battalion Museum. So that red circle? That red circle? That's not just a marker, that says that's the bit that's... That is Te Pitsukunua, which is the whole of the oh, okay. So in the actual schedule, it's listed correctly, but on the maps, it's incorrect. Yeah, I, I did get the um, map from Heritage New Zealand, that actually differs from the outstanding landscape overlay as well. There's, there's just slight differences in what they cover, um, which is interesting. Uh, in terms of historic heritage, there is only one mapped notation in the district land, which is historic building 100. But if you actually look at the list, it covers Hobson's Memorial, which is that turnaround area shown on that land. Uh, the tree house, the fire, and the flagpole. I don't know why when they originally put it in, they only just had one notation, because normally with historic buildings, you'll have each of them listed. So 
So when you actually kind of look at the map, you know what's covered, but at the moment it really, really looks like it covers the, um, the tree house. And I've just left this up there for the signs to talk about later. That's an aerial of the whole estate, uh, just so you can see the, the land that we're covering. Um, a bit of background for me, I've been doing resource consents for Waitangi Limited for a number of years. And as I've been going through and doing these consents, even in the operative plan now, um, there's, there's just so many issues. And that they, they picked up for really minor things, even now. And what's coming in in the operative plan, uh, in the proposed plan, is just adding more to that. So some of the rules that are in the operative plan at the moment um, are causing us to get resource consent for us, for example. And that's where things are heading. It there was not going to change. Um, in terms of planning, I've found no other site in the whole district which will have a similar number of zones and overlays that impact on it. Um, as discussed, well, all these overlays serve a particular purpose in covering different natural and built environment features and values and practice with a large number of overlays which impact upon the tree grounds. Uh, you know, it's going to result in plant, complicated planning assessments and minor activities are going to trigger the need for resource committee. Some examples of this are untaken repair and maintenance that Ben's been speaking about. That's desperate. Um, this activity is offered as a permitted activity. I will once the that mapping area, area, area that I uh, noted before is fixed in regards to such as cultural significance to Māori. As that particular rule is not a listed activity within the chapter, it defaults to a description of it. Another example of installing a new structure, such as an outdoor bench seat, um, as it's not installed into farming, is within an outstanding natural landscape, and is not being sought by the requesting party, this would also trigger consent. I acknowledge some of the changes detailed in the Section 42A reports, removing the ancillary to farming requirement will assist with the uh, coastal environment and outstanding natural landscape triggers for this particular example, but nevertheless consent will be triggered. One other example to consider is whether the planting of a dead tree tree is considered to meet the definition of earthworks. As if this is the case, this would also trigger consent under the side of Fox and Fence technologies. There are some, these are some of the more perverse outcomes we're seeking to avoid through this process. My team's main relief is to implement special purpose zone. This special purpose zone will cover the whole state. The special purpose zoning will ensure bespoke rules can be written to give effect to the various overlays. It is proposed that these rules will in most cases take precedence over the many overlays which apply to the site, meaning that when assessing a proposal at the estate, you would look at the special purpose chapter rather than all the various zone and overlay chapters. Special purpose objectives and policies will also apply to the estate. These objectives and policies will provide the site with the mana and the acknowledgement it deserves. These tailored rules and framework ensure future development need not be considered through the lens of a production zone. These objectives and policies would reference the purpose stated in the Waitangi National Transport Act, which sets the scene for Waitangi and how it operates now and into the future. Across the estate, there are quite different areas of development and historical significance. As a result, we'll be seeking the inclusion of subzones to best differentiate between the areas. While this matter will be discussed at length in hearing 19 later next year, it is necessary to set the scene as our primary relief does and will continue to impact on the various public hearings being heard throughout this process. In regard to our secondary relief, in most cases, I am in agreement with the recommendations made within the Section 42A reports, as this provides some relief for those rules which is currently drafted catch some of those minor activities. There are a couple of tweaks I've recommended, such as to the colour scheme standard for clarification, to include reference to the outstanding natural feature categories in the schedule, as this is referenced within the rule as proposed in the section for the way, and inclusions to the setback from me high was strength standard. I also comment on the work that has been done specifically for my family in terms of sensitivity ratings where built development could have lower threshold in specific areas. Rather than seeking change to the district-wide rules to accommodate this, 
the inclusion of the specifically for the white family estate would be a better outcome. And I'm happy to discuss any of these changes to the panel in terms of detail. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, we sort of we, we look forward to seeing what you come up with later on in the hearing process. But um, it, it, yeah, it's sort of helpful to indicate we want to go. Mm. Um, and obviously, a lot of work will need to be done. Um, and we we'll probably encourage you to engage with council officers um, uh, along the way um, so that they're advised um, um, with, with when you're here. So, would you be looking at, obviously, I think you're not. You're looking to create your own zone. How would the overlays fit within the special purpose zone? Would you have the overlays removed? I think it's important that you recognise the overlays. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily want to remove them. More what I was thinking of doing is saying that the special zone would take precedence over those overlays, but still ensure that whatever rules we are writing are in line with those. And so you'd just be referring back to one rule. Say, for example, your um, building size restrictions, for example, rather than going to the, the an underlying zoning and all the various overlays, you would just look at one particular rule, which would encompass all of those overlay steps. Okay. And um, obviously, it was the, um, the the estate is, is really large, it's, and of course, yes. most people just think it's just the treaty grounds, but it's probably three times that. In fact, it's more. <laughs> so, I'm assuming your special zone would your special zone have like sub zones or precincts or whatever? Correct. Well, it has sub zones. Um, mm -hmm. because, because it's so large and because things vary across the estate, right. especially for the treaty grounds, we are looking to have something that's quite restrictive. Mm -hmm. There and then uh, out from that, you'd look at you know something around the top, or you'd look at something around like sport and recreation as well. To so kind of take into account those existing uses, but also have that overall overarching objectives and policies that ensure that you always refer back to the treaty grounds because that is your central location that has your historical significance. So you want to make sure that any development that is happening is an association with that and also refers back to the original legislation for why that's been set aside. And, and, and if your special zone provisions were to take precedence over the favourite things that you character mm -hmm. and smacks and features mm -hmm. and a coastal highway, would you have bespoke provisions that would achieve those overlay outcomes Correct. within your special zone? Correct. So you're, you're, you're almost, you're you're going to propose a special zone set of overlay provisions Correct. that would address the matters of national significance and, Correct. and all the higher and, documents. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Well, that's, that's, um, that's helpful to understand where you're coming from. Um, do you have any questions? You'd probably be disappointed if I didn't have a question. I thought I'd be bring something up. But <laughs> the, the evidence is pretty pretty high quality from, from everybody and the legal submissions of Joanne, the, the completeness. But just in terms of your appendix, that's you know, like your secondary relief. I mean, your the alternative relief mm -hmm. as such. The concern I've got is this idea of future discourse with council officers or council consultants. Because I'm aware of a hearing I was at recently in Tara, where the, one of the officers stood up and said, you know, four years ago you sent us off to talk with the, the applicants, and four years on it's still a disaster because we don't need to agree on anything. Mm -hmm. So it's really just how you carry through that future discourse with the council officers. I mean, it seems to me that what you're saying is you get together with them and, and talk about what, what you're going to do or the like. Mm -hmm. I mean, would it be a better proposition to go to the council officer and consult them so this is what we what we're really looking for. Give the council's consultant time to look at that and move on from there. That's ideally what we plan to do. Yeah. So we've we've started drafting things up already. Mm. Um. So we can have something to present to council earlier in the piece to get mm. some feedback. We've already had uh, some a couple of conversations with council as well on how we might go about this. 
um, what we could provide and kind of some initial feedback we might hear from them. So, mm. so would you see a decision out or a recommendation out of this group, of this panel, giving some direction to that? I think one of the things that we're thinking about the early days yet yes. is that you know there's a lot of things that are going to happen in hearing 19. Yes. Yes. The rezoning hearing is going to end up being quite a large hearing. So we're sort of starting to think about with how we structure those hearings, but also too, you know, with the special the special zone people mm. who are having to write a whole set of new provisions, mm -hmm. um, perhaps setting a direction for early engagement with council potentially yeah. conferencing mm -hmm. um, whereas you've got a, a number of other submitters who just want a different zone that's already in the plan so on the face of it that sounds like an easier prospect to um to deal with an ev as evidence whereas you've got a whole lot of zones that aren't in the plan yet and have to be you know and have a much higher burden of section 32 Section 32A and analysis required, which would suggest you know you would want longer lead in time. I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, and I, and I think the unique nature of the site deserves you know a unique approach um, rather than trying to tailor what's happening you know by tanging yeah. into a, a series of zones and overlays that the council's plan has at the moment. And that's probably been a difficulty over the history of, of dealing with what mm -hmm. um, Yeah. So I mean the opportunity we have is that we've got a reasonable amount of time between now and then, although I'm sure time will fly. Oh, I, will. <laughs> I will probably say, well, are we there already <laughs> in a year's time? But I think we have some opportunities. So we're thinking about um, we're gonna work through that with you know, parties and see how if we can't get some clear direction, that'll be assistance to everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> And I'll, I'll talk to Simon and the, the table here is really helpful, but a lot of the table references and um, some of the things as well. So I'll just have some questions for you. Is there a question at the time well, I've got one about the map, if I may, and thank you for your for your evidence, um, Mr. Jacobs. Can I yep, I've started. Um, it's probably related to something that Mr. Dalton was mentioning about potentially selling. Parts of the land, which is obviously not ideal, but is that extent there um, consistent with what was originally gifted, or has there been land? There has been some land that has been added over time. I tried to do a bit of research as to when that happened, right? Um, but it was quite some time ago, so I don't know exactly when that occurred. Okay, so nothing's been sold. Since the original. I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, not from what I've seen, more it's just been added to. Okay. I'm just thinking ahead if it's a special zone and it was sold, it might need to have a plan change or something to match for the new owners, but that's in a technicality. I was just interested to see if that was. Yeah, it's something we can think about and cover. Sure. But no. no, from what I've seen and the research I've done, it's only been added to. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your evidence. Um, and yeah, clearly laid out, so that's been great. And also, um, as you say, the state requires long term master plan. Um, you have know, the of controls. And you raised that the site of significance that's on the, um, on the treaty grounds is from Pohede Matona. What I wanted to check was would you be looking at getting. Um, getting that as part of your master planning or your wider considerations and sometimes getting that corrected in collaboration with Kohiringa Tonga, because it's in their schedule and it's come through, would you be looking at getting clarification around here with that sort of stuff? Oh, I think it should be fixed for sure, definitely the mapping, because it needs to match up with what's in the schedule. Mm -hmm. And like I hear it in New Zealand on their website, they've got a map. That shows the full extent. That should be what should the plan. How that looks um, when we actually come to do uh, present our special zoning case at a later hearing, I'm not sure whether we change something there. Um, we're actively working with Heritage New Zealand as well, and they they're very much on board with what we're doing. Um, yeah. Who's put the site?
in it's the, new. It's new. So I don't know where it came out in the Heritage New Zealand list, but that side of what's going on to Māori is not currently in the operative district plan. It's a new one that has been added. Do you know who nominated it? I'm assuming it's just come from the list because what council finds. Uh, council could respond to this, um, but I'm assuming that anything that's been added to the Heritage New Zealand list, council has just taken from that and inserted into the district plan. Thank you. Yeah, it's one of the, the interesting ones where normally your requesting party is the local iwi or hapa, whereas there's a couple that have been added, which the requesting party is Heritage New Zealand, which is, is not too standard. Okay, thank you. I don't think there's any more. Oh, can I want to indicate the questions that are following the, the landscape uh, evidence. Um, there's in particular um, the buildings within the setback from me, Harwood Springs. Um, so I was wanted to hear the evidence on that before I ask those questions. Um, also, um, it talked about um, the efforts and vegetation clearance because back to the estate. Uh, and further to that as well, the experience and the different building heights um, relative to the evidence in the special landscape. Yeah, perfect. I'm not going to answer the buildings uh, setback from Mingo Water Springs. Um, when I originally did my submission, I noted uh, a couple of examples that I also thought should be um, excluded. And um, the response was that I hadn't given enough detail for those. So what I've done in my evidence um, is I've actually given reasons why I think those should be exempt. And it's things such as like for restoration and enhancement purposes, like your pest fence fences. Um, things such as natural hazard mitigation, like your sea walls, because generally you have regional resource consent for those. Um, post and white fences for the purpose of protection from farm stock. Currently, if you were to put in a new fence that's within 30 metres from the coast, you would need resource consent to be able to the structure. Um, lighting poles, by all, or on behalf of the local authority, and footpaths and paving, no greater than two metres in width. I don't know if you've looked at your designation, the council designation for roads. But that only applies to roads, not any other infrastructure, such as lighting and footpaths. Meaning that, especially because you know a lot of council roads are quite close to the coast, they are going to trigger consent. Um, where it may not be road, it may be you know a council reserve. Um, you're not going to have any exemptions for those. Um, also, just your boundary fencing and walls at the moment. Boundary fences aren't defined as a building, but with the introduction of the definition of structure, things such as your boundary fences are going to be captured. So, those are just a couple of examples I noted. Mm. I think those questions are really helpful. The, the other matter that was brought up um, from Mark Ben is regarding the events. And I think that, as you highlight, you know, significant national events that have effects that you can't necessarily have controls um, over. Um, I wasn't sure about that and how that was going to be addressed. Um, I guess I'm not sure about the landscape in the current hearing, but just uh, in terms of the planning rules, etc., related to that site. We are looking at introducing rules to cover that. Because uh, obviously it's something that has changed over a number of years, scale especially. And as Ben's kind of stated in, in his evidence, there's a lot of measures that writing is in place anyway. Um, so we'll be looking at writing rules in that regard. I'm not sure exactly what it's going to look like yet, but we'll put that together and maybe discuss it at the um, temporary events. Um, picture, or maybe even here in my thing. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Jenkins. So, we now um, have evidence, Mr. Cocker. Are you doing a presentation, or are you just going to speak? <laughs> no, I'm just going to 
Hello everyone, my name is Simon Cocker. I'm the Landscape Architect and Principal of Simon Cocker Landscape Architecture. I'm the on behalf of Waitangi Limited. I'm the effects of the proposed district plan and its management of the Waitangi National Trust Estate. Um, just to add to my um, qualification section in, in, in my statement of evidence, um, I voted on day one of the uh, of the this hearing. There was some discussion about the uh, Northland Mapping Project, um, which one of the outstanding natural landscapes and pictures. Um, I was part of a team that um, formed the Northland Mapping Project team. So uh, my goal was to not to get back to the farm. Mike principally focused on the far north and I was focused on Clyde and Clyde uh, Lane. But it, just in terms of the process, I can answer questions if, if there are any outstanding questions on them. Um, my summary statement will focus on Wetangi Limited secondary fallback relief with respect to the parts of the identified proposed plan that apply to the estate. In February 2023, I was engaged by Waitangi Limited to undertake a landscape assessment to inform its submission on the proposed plan. It seeks to create a special, a new special purpose zone within the meaning of the national planning standards to apply to the estate. I subsequently commenced my assessment of the landscape values and sensitivities throughout the estate to inform Ms. Jacobs evaluation of the appropriateness a special purpose so I was applying to, to protect those values and sensitivities. My assessment is in, is in draft but is to be finalised and presented to the panel for hearing 19. We've introduced the extent of the estate already. It's, it's, a, it's a large area of land and, and um, my assessment is it's confirmed that it, given its extent Obviously, there's a coastal coastal element, an estuarine element, and there's a, there's a more of an inland, inland element that does possess quite a, a range of sensitivities and values. Um, not, not only in terms of in terms of visibility, obviously, but the coastal section has has particular sensitivities, and the estuarine area has particular sensitivities. But there are areas, parts of the estate which have lower sensitivities in certain visual terms. My draft, assess uh, my draft assessment map the estate it defined a number of character areas and assigned landscape values to those areas. Importantly, the assessment determined the range of values and sensitivities across the estate, and this has, in my opinion, confirmed that a special purpose zone could be an effective way to protect those values and sensitivities. I will now address my time limited key matters of secondary relief and those apply to my area of expertise, starting with the permitted building size. Section 6.2.17 of the Section 40 report has recommended that the permitted size of a building be increased to 15 square metres within the coastal environment and that it not be used as a res for residential activity. I am accepting of this standard, however, I support a more restrictive Permitted building size of 30 square metres for the treaty grounds. Although the treaty grounds has an outstanding landscape classification, the character and values of this landscape <coughs> differs from the majority of the ONL. That's the, the ONL across the district. Being imbued with a significant cultural, with significant cultural and associative values rather than a high level of natural values. The more restrictive permitted building size is proposed since the treaty grounds are of a smaller scale than the majority of the ONL within the wider district, and the small scale lends the landscape a finer grain. This finer grain, cultural landscape, is more sensitive to change occasioned by built form, where this may detract from the interplay between the existing historic and cultural structures and the areas of open space and special framework. And just on that, I was involved in the um, in the development of the Telewaropa, the Marian um, Italian Museum, um, and gained consents for that. And there was a lot of um, consideration given to how that building would fit into the vegetative framework of, 
of the treaty grounds. This far, in, insofar as identifying individual trees, because it's sitting within, within an area of, of vegetation, identifying individual <coughs> trees that would be retained and how we could just manipulate the footprint so that it was integrated into that framework. And turning to height restrictions to buildings and structures, the Section 42A report relies on recommendations of the new personnel, landscape architects, to justify retaining a five metre height restriction within the coastal environment. In my view, while in some more visually sensitive locations, maps in the appendix to my evidence, a five metre height control is appropriate. In other less sensitive, low, uh, visually sensitive locations, the height control should be less restrictive. I agree with the opinion expressed in section 3.2c of the um, Absalom report, which states that the new development within ONL and ONF has the potential to undermine values identified for protection and support to the permitted height limit. The five metre limit is relatively restricted and is challenging to com comply with where a building is to be constructed on a slope. As a result, the restriction has the potential to force the, the location of a building on flatter land, such as the ridge crest. Notwithstanding that, I accept that the recommended discretionary status will allow for assessment of the potential adverse effects on landscape values. I am therefore of the opinion that a five metre height restriction is appropriate where an area has been identified as having a high or moderate sensitivity. That's referencing my um, assessment. Outside of these areas, I'm of the opinion that an eight metre height restriction would be more appropriate, again, within the Watan state. With works of indigenous vegetation clearance, the section 42A report has recommended at section 5.2.14 that earthworks be restricted to 50 metres squared if an ONC area or um, or, uh, or within an area of high natural character. Outside of these areas, a 100 square metre restriction would apply. Cut house are proposed to remain at one metre. I accept this recommendation where it applies to the wider district. Vegetation clearance has been split from the earthquake standard and will remain at 50 square metres. The high natural character area and 400 metres outside of these areas. I generally accept this recommendation where it applies to the wider district. I am of the opinion, however, that an approach based on landscape values and sensitivities will enable a more targeted landscape appropriate approach to prescribing controls on earthworks and vegetation clearance as part of a special purpose zone for the estate. As provided in Ms. Jacobs' evidence, more restrictive standards could apply to the treaty grounds given its landscape values. The earthwork standard could also be modified to acknowledge um, the sensitivities in terms of archaeological features within the golf course. Outside of these areas, the lesser restrictions as proposed under CES3 uh, could apply, except within those areas subject to the high natural character areas. I support the WS, um, the, uh, WS said, um, S5 rule from the landscape perspective. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No. Just on that last one, what else do you use? Tiny special. Special diagram. So that's part of it. Right. Okay. I guess um, interesting then how you mentioned that you were involved with the Northland Regional Mapping Project. <laughs> that was at that regional scale. Um, that's correct. Yes. And then now we're dealing at a district scale where the yeah, basically brought that mapping down to the localised context and now you're dealing at a almost a site specific scale mm -hmm. um, where you can get to the detail that is recommending eight metres for example building height in certain locations but what I'm hearing you say is that that would only apply in a special zone sort of situation mm -hmm. because it can't apply as a district wide blanket approach and, and you're saying five metres would be more um, more appropriate way to go. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's right. I mean, I mean saying that height limit five meters is, is quite a blunt instrument, mm. um, but a, a necessary one. Mm. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, um, five meters is, is quite restrictive on, on slopes, but, but, yet, but yes, uh, essentially what my assessment of the estate is doing is, is 
is going through the process that, that a landscape academy would go through in assessing a particular site. Yeah. So so it, you know, being able to look at the state, the state in that level of detail enables the mapping of you know, yeah. the, the higher sensitivity where that five meter yeah. restriction should apply. Yeah. And then the lower sensitivity where that. And if we could do that across the whole district, you know, we might have a variation and yeah. you know, that's yeah. that's yeah. that would be yeah, but, but what you've also said is that if in a, another site with a five meter pipeline applies, you could, as a discretionary activity, look to do an eight meter building, perhaps if it was yes. an appropriate like that. Through design or just yeah. through the more sensitive yeah. placement of the building. Okay, well, that clarifies things for me, thank you. And I guess a lot of it will come through into that next session for this mm -hmm. discussion that we've been on. No other questions from me, thanks, Jerry. Thank you. I just had a supplementary question to that relating to the um, the height definition and using the rolling height method for the the maximum heights because it was a discussion that we did have um, through other submissions. Um, do you have any comments about using that method versus other methods? Would that, as you say, relatively restrictive and challenging to comply with on on slopes? Um, so it's the rolling height method which is generally the um, and, and that, in my opinion, works, works quite well. Um, and that comes, that's usually specified as the height above existing ground, so there's potential for people to dig down a little bit and, and then go up a little bit. Um, so, so I guess I'm going to put the rolling height, rolling height method. So, so you think because people can go down, because you're saying that even though people can go down, it's still quite restrictive because it forces people to go on planted land because it's easier to file them planted land. Um, yes, I mean, in, in most cases, people are looking to, to minimise costs. So I mean, excavation, mm, yeah, that's when also you know, if, you're, if you're stepping, you can you can possibly achieve those out the, the five meter height limit by stepping the building down the slope, but again, again that, that increases cost. So, you know, quite often people will just seek to, to minimize costs by going onto the flat land and minimizing excavation. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. 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 The last evidence about the definition of structure, I think, was a really important matter that was raised in the planning evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think really highlights um, some of the issues with that definition. So just highlighting that, um, probably be looking at further insight into that definition and its, and its practical implications, um, not just for the site, but <laughs> and also the um, the designations chapter and what's actually um, provided for within that for other activities than just the road, you know, that might be a book part, etc. Uh, I think that was the Yeah, thank you. Just a follow up to the height question, I suppose you've got some unique, well, mm -hmm. the height standards primarily, I think, runs and maybe more fun. <laughs> And because I think that's what's anticipated districts like in these overlay areas. Whereas the treaty grounds are, are, are erecting very unique buildings that serve quite a different purpose. And I'm thinking about um, the two museums that are erecting the later. How, how tall is the, um, the Mary Battalion Museum building? I feel like eight meters. Yeah, even though it's single story. Correct. And of course, that you, you need eight meters because you need to create a sense of space. Correct. Um, and what is the only can be sacred mm -hmm. uh, celebration and commemoration of, um, of military history. So mm -hmm. we almost appear that goes, but again, it might justify why you may need a, a special set of provisions because you're going to be erecting buildings that aren't going to, it seems to me, erecting buildings that aren't going to be anywhere else in the district and would serve a certain function there. 
maybe even unique or at least very quite exceptional. Okay, thanks. So you've given us plenty to think about. Um, and we do look forward to hearing from you further, further down the line. And again, we're going to figure out how we can better facilitate that process. And so we'll be in touch. Have you got anything else to add? It's just two points very, very briefly, sir. Thank you. And the one was just, just picking up on Commissioner Kitherton's question. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a very helpful exchange. Thank you um, to, to tie that off. Um, yeah, it's, it's awkward the secondary, the primary secondary relief thing. But I think to be to be clear, because Mr. Cocker has done that depth of analysis into the values within this particular site and the different sensitivities and things, um, our focus is on the special purpose zoning and that and and, and what my team is trying to achieve will be presented to you and will be achieved through that. But if that were not to find favour with the panel in due course. Then yeah, the secondary relief is, you know, is to nonetheless reflect the different sensitivities across the, this site um, to make tweaks specific to what to like one thing a little bit that makes sense. You know, it allows, for example, a you know, high you know, almost as a as a, a line item in the, in the table of the rule. That's that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's clumsy and, and yeah. hence hence why the focus is really on a bespoke solution for the site. I just wanted to be trying to be as clear as I could. No, it's not no. the opposite. Just in terms of the primary secondary relief. And so the other point was just just to come back and, and say, yeah, thank you again for your signal around the process. And we'd be very mindful of that too. We understand court. We're looking very much looking forward to working with the, the great council team on on this proposal. Um, conscious that in the lead up to hearing 19, you know, we've met their evidence exchanges. Of, a 42 hour reporting time frame and, and working back from that, obviously there needs to be a fully fledged proposal that, you know, there's a line in the sand, a point, a reference point for that section 42 hour reporting. So, so we, we're conscious of that, but haven't kind of worked through the details. Very much in the panel's hands as to how best to, to lock that in, because I, I think we all agree some structure around that um, would, would help. Um, so whether it's a matter of Rochelle talking with the council team and, and suggesting suggesting some shape and some dates and put, putting that before you. That would be one way to do it. Otherwise, I mean, um, you know, if the panel's got some particular dates in mind, very happy to hear those and look for those. Obviously, we don't want to overpromise in terms of the first step for you know the drafting to be complete. But as Rochelle said, it's very it's well advanced. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think it may, it may come down to you know, are there are there special zone options that are literally only involving two parties, council officers and a landowner, or are there multiple parties? And that may be, you know, we have to think about how, how we manage that process. But certainly we are thinking about you know, um, facilitating the information exchange mm -hmm. yes. in, a, in a more helpful way. Yes, yes. For, for our part, well, we understand the onus is on us to put something yes. forward to, to work it up, to talk to the right people, including in particular the council, but also think you know, and and various yeah. the other people in town in particular, which is that's also a further submitter, which kind of is neat in this process. Um, but who do you loud and clear and and if we can collectively put some shape around that, then all the better in that perspective. Okay. I, I, it's quite hard to see you because you've got the brightness off in the shadows. Oh, the wonderful <laughs> landscape behind you. Feel free to wave your arms. I was patiently waiting to, for my time to um, complete. Um, yes. But just to note that there are perhaps some things that we haven't yet shared with the panel in terms of our approach towards these matters. Yes. Um, that perhaps we might just throw, cast a little more light, so to speak, on it um, as we get towards the end of this week. Uh, and the hearing this week. Uh, we have actively, um, I understand Ms. Worcester's been in contact uh, with uh, my team's representatives. I myself have also touched base and sort of given them a high level indication of, of perhaps what we're looking to do. Um, we have advanced, I guess, um, to points around allocation of responsibilities within the teams that Andrew is going to do, uh, which parties. So this thinking is already really quite well advanced, um, and we're just looking to turn our minds to the sort of specific um, requests and advice that we might give to 
whole range of people requesting, uh, particularly rezonings, uh, particularly more significant ones, perhaps not all parties, um, to I guess make it more efficient and effective hearing process for uh, ourselves in the panel and also the facilitators. So we have turned our mind to it. We have done. We, we haven't just thought about it. We're actively doing things. Um, yeah, to move those things along. Well, that's, that's really encouraging because yeah, I think we're all on the same page on that basis. I mean, what we don't want to do is just rely on the exchange dates that you would have for just normal provisions and then having a raft of evidence in Section 32 analysis and provisions within a really, really confined period of time when we have literally 12 months <laughs> available to us. So, um, okay, well, we, we, we'll engage you know, with council officers and other, other submitters to see if we can't um, sort of formalise um, the structure of the process. We'll be interested to hear your further thoughts on that too. Are there any other points you'd like to make? Uh, not today, sir. Okay. If okay. I could just respond, sorry. Yes. Uh, and to Felicity's <laughs> question in regards to the differences in height. Um, yeah. In the operative district plan, we've got the mean height um, method and so the rolling height method. Um, at the moment, where a proposal may only just slightly reach the standard for height, you can use the mean height um, method on a slope, mm -hmm. and that can be the difference between mean resource consent or not. Um, in most of the coastal areas at the moment, the permitted standard is eight metres. So with that added restriction of five metres, um, it's likely that we will see quite a number of more resource consents required. If you look at the rules as proposed now um, in the coastal environment, um, basically residential activity is going to require resource consent anyway and have visual considerations given to it. So maybe some additional thought is needed around whether or not for just a minor infringement where the mean height method may assist. Maybe that could be something to think about as well. Because it may mean the difference between only just one rule breach as opposed to two. Look, uh, I'd like to just finish by saying, look, thank you very much again to the panel um, for hearing us. So we've got a few, few minutes over, so thank you very much for that. Um, you know, it's been our pleasure to be here and we look forward to assisting you through the process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that, that, that brings us now to the, the morning tea break. We are looking to have a 20 minute break. <laughs> um, our next submitter is Mr. Mr. Malcolm. Right, Mr. Malcolm, are you happy to present your submission at 11? Yeah, thank you. We'll take a morning tea break from the clock. And thanks again for your um, really well presented submission. Thank you. We're doing it. Stop recording. Thank <clears throat> you.